Well, we're back in controversy land in evangelical circles. A recent ad for New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho, put out on social media said this, young men wanted must be willing to hoist the Jolly Roger and Johnny Cash's favorite finger whenever faced with idolatry. The favorite finger that is referred to there is the middle finger, which is, of course, a very serious swear word in American culture. We talked about this yesterday in some depth why is this an issue that New St. Andrews and Moscow and Canon Press and related entities, and I assume persons, uh, are, are promoting the usage of the middle finger? Why is this okay? Um, you'll recall, if you listened to that previous episode, that I condemned this action in no uncertain terms. I didn't do so because I myself am a functionally perfect Christian or because I am vying for the candidate candidate position of church lady at large in evangelicalism in 2024. I do I did so because the Bible says we are not to be a people of unwholesome speech, Ephesians 4.29. Uh, we have a witness to the world. Our witness is supposed to be distinct from the world. We're in the world, but not of the world, according to Jesus and John's gospel. And so this is actually a matter uh, that we, we kind of need to chase down. And we need to do it in particular for the rising generation because the there are a lot of young men and young women who are tracking with Doug Wilson and Moscow generally and its institutions, and they have been encouraged by the kind of countercultural joy, that spirit, that serrated edge, so-called, that has come out of Moscow in the last five years or so, or even beyond that. And they're looking to Moscow, and they're looking to these institutions and to Wilson himself as a kind of guide. Because, as I said, a good number of evangelical leaders have sort of at least to, to a degree, lost their voice with regard to a countercultural spirit that is marked by joy. And so there were a lot of uh, folks who went silent in momentous matters in the last roughly three to five years. Doug Wilson and others in Moscow spoke up boldly, and in some cases prophetically and genuinely so, and that led to them gaining a lot of market share, a lot of adherence. A lot of people are watching Canon Plus for entertainment now, uh, for example. And so Moscow has a ton of influence today. Let's just be honest. It does. And Moscow has a lot of critics, but we can understand why Moscow has a fair bit of influence. Part of why is not just that countercultural joy. Part of why is because they're excellent at media. And this uh, commercial we played in the previous episode shows that. But here's the deal. <laughs> You don't get to put out anything you want under the banner Christian. Your Christian content, here's quite a, a statement for you, needs to be genuinely Christian. And to be genuinely Christian, you need to accord with what the Bible teaches and therefore holiness. We're going to talk more about why this is so in today's episode, part two of two of Grace and Truth. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I will be your host uh, I am the senior director of the Dobson Culture Center at the James Dobson Family Institute. It's a great joy to work there these days. Just begun that work a few weeks ago. Thankful for that. Thankful for my producer, Misty, for all her help in these summer months, summer weeks, as we uh, bring the summer series to a close of Grace and Truth. I gave you four thoughts, four responses to this NSA, New St. Andrews commercial, in the previous episode. I'm going to keep plowing through in terms of uh, five more responses uh, to this uh, commercial. Fifth, we need to understand that building civilization or preserving the West is not the same thing as advancing Christ's kingdom. Building civilization or preserving the West is not the same thing as advancing Christ's spiritual kingdom. A lot of the conversations we're having today about America and the public square and the church uh, go right here, this particular issue, because lots of people now think that the church's primary mandate is to preserve the West, to make sure America endures, uh, to, to uh, try to protect civilization as we have known it. You got to say several things here. <laughs> you got to say, the church is fundamentally called Matthew 5, 13 to 16, to be salt and light where we are. 
That's a huge part of what I try to say in my tiny little ministry. That's a huge part of what, for example, the Dobson Culture Center stands for, that I lead. We want Christians to be active and engaged in their community, in their context, not just in America, but across the world. We need the church to be preservative, salt, and we need the church to be proclamatory, light, uh, overcoming darkness by God's grace. We very much need that. That means that wherever you have, let's say, uh, you know, a meaningful number of Christians in a country, in a nation, hopefully there is going to be good amounts of Christian, biblical, gospel influence in that place. Maybe even those Christians in that nation or country, or let's say in a smaller level community, will play a serious role in preserving things and and uh, helping grace, truth, beauty, and goodness to endure, at least to some level, in a given place. We really should fight for our civilization as Christians. I wholeheartedly believe that and stand for that and promote that even in, in my own work. But you've got to understand this. Building civilization or preserving it is not necessarily the same thing as advancing the spiritual kingdom of Christ. Jesus said this about his kingdom in John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. What Jesus says there does not close off Christians being involved in the military or the police force or something like that. So when the NSA commercial that we're talking about talked about repelling invaders, there may be a role for Christian men to play in military efforts. Absolutely there is in my judgment because of scripture, Luke 11 and other texts. However, we are not to conflate uh, the preservation of America as a civilization with the advancement of Christ's spiritual kingdom. The two can overlap and in America definitely have as they have in England, for example, and Scotland and other countries. But if you promote American democracy and um, religious liberty, you've done good things that I think are biblical things to do. That does not necessarily mean that Christ's kingdom has advanced. Why do I say that? Because Christ's kingdom advances uh, through the making of disciples. Christ's kingdom advances when a sinner is one to faith and then trained in the Christian faith and is a meaningful member of the local church being baptized into it. Matthew 28, 16 to 20, that's the fulfillment of the Great Commission. This is where I have a sharp disagreement with Moscow and Doug Wilson and uh, the entities of Moscow, because Moscow is very much advancing a post-millennial vision that sees, really does see, I'm not trying to speak out of turn or, or mischaracterize things, sees um, the advancement of society in a generally Christian form as synonymous with the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus. And I do not think you should conflate those two realities. I do not think that the world is being progressively Christianized right now until it will reach its perfect state eventually, even if you locate much of that Christianization in pulpit preaching. Um, I do not believe we're Christianizing our society or our nation. And I do not believe, because Jesus tells me I cannot believe this, that you can advance the kingdom of Jesus. Again, I'm speaking very specifically in ways that our fuzzy-minded era doesn't always like or listen to. You can't advance the kingdom of Jesus through the sword. You can preserve or protect a civilization through the sword. That's why it's so important to understand that the mission of the state as given by God is not the mission of the church. Romans 13, Matthew 22, uh, 1 Peter 2, other texts bear on this reality that I'm sketching out. My friend Jeff Moore has helped us a lot in thinking through that particular issue and giving us those categories of theology such that we don't conflate the mission of the state being to punish evil and reward good with the mission of the church. They're not the same thing. They're not to be fused. The New Testament, Paul in Romans 13, for example, does not tell us uh, to intertwine the magistrate 
so to speak, with the elder. The elder's work is not the magistrate's work. The magistrate's work is not the elder's work. A Christian can absolutely serve as a public leader, as a president, as a prime minister, as a senator, as a mayor, as a governor, on and on it goes. A Christian can definitely do that. Please do that, Christian. We need a lot more of that. And you can be a witness such that the Great Commission does advance because disciples are made in those kind of positions. And even you can help a society remove impediments to the fulfillment of the Great Commission in a really positive way. That's why I've talked about the importance of free speech on this podcast. That's why I've talked about the importance of religious liberty on this podcast. The gospel uh, and its advancement, the advancement of the kingdom of Christ does not depend upon religious liberty or free speech, but man, what a blessing when you have uh, free speech and religious liberty such that gospel proclamation, proclamation of the whole counsel of God more broadly can go out and disciples can be freely made. That's a wonderful reality. Nonetheless, while you can um, aid the church to a degree in being free to proclaim Christ, you cannot make disciples through the nation, through the work of the government. Um, through the, the use of the sword. Only the spirit makes disciples, not the sword. So people who are forcibly converted to Jesus, unless the spirit works in their heart, are in no way converted to Jesus, just so we are clear. NSA, in its uh, marketing language on social media, um, that included the video we played last episode, said this, to reform the West and recover its glory, we must cultivate men guided by the enduring virtues of faith, hope, and love, men whose strength is drawn from the joy of truth and the freedom it brings. I don't disagree with the need to cultivate men in a biblical gospel shaped way. We need joyful men. Uh, we need men who stand on truth. So not throwing any shots in that respect. And I'd very much want the West not to fall if the West doesn't have to fall. However, we should not understand preserving the West, preserving civilization as the necessary outworking of the advancement of the spiritual kingdom of Christ. Much more to say along this count, but I need to hasten on. My sixth response to this NSA commercial is this. We need carefulness as well as courage. We need carefulness as well as courage. Why am I using this kind of language? Because Moscow as uh, a tribe, I believe has been pretty seriously marked by a statement Doug Wilson made uh, over a decade ago. What I don't mean is that every third sentence someone says in Moscow, Idaho today is the sentence I'm going to talk about in just a minute. I don't think that. But I do believe that there is an ethos in Moscow that I personally see lived out and practiced that relates very much to the formulation I'm going to quote. Here is that formulation. This is from Doug Wilson's A Sermon to the Governor and Legislature of Idaho from July 8th, 2012. Hey, let me jump out of this discussion for just a second and inform you of something that's pretty important for you to consider. Economists are warning us about massive tax hikes that could hit your IRA and your 401k hard. It's hard to say these words, isn't it? With inflation rising and global uncertainty, it's no wonder central banks and many Americans are turning to gold. Proverbs 2120 reminds us to preserve what we've built. If you haven't considered gold yet, now's the time. Reach out to Priority Gold to see how they can help you diversify with physical gold and silver. Text GOLDEN to 800-405-GOLD for a free gold info guide and see if you qualify for free shipping and storage. Don't wait. Get your portfolio working for you while the market is golden. Text GOLDEN to 800-405-GOLD to learn more. That's text GOLDEN to 800-405-GOLD. Now let's jump back into our conversation. Desperate times call for faithful men and not for the careful men. This is Wilson sermonizing and writing. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. So desperate times 
according to Doug Wilson, mean we need faithful men, but we don't need careful men. Careful men are not needed in desperate times. Explicitly, Wilson says the careful men, they their shift comes later when there's a biography to write. <laughs> And this is a little bit self-aggrandizing as it's presented. Uh, they write the uh, the laudable biographies uh, that extol the courage of um, the faithful men, the courageous men, um, not the careful men. That quotation, um, it has a ring of truth because – Honestly, in all times, at all seasons, we need men of courage. We have to have men of courage. There's never a shift when we don't need a courageous man and a whole pack of godly Christian men to show courage. We need that perpetually. So we're always in need of courage. There's never a time when you only need careful men and you don't need courageous men. Until Jesus returns and makes the world right, you've got to have courageous men. But here is the problem with Wilson's formulation, and this is going to be tied into NSA's commercial as I go. The courageous men are called to be careful men. What Wilson splits apart, Scripture holds together. Wilson says we need courageous men, we don't need careful men. The Bible, God, speaking through his word, says we need Courageous men who are careful men. Don't take my word from it. Here, Joshua 1, 7. I'm going to read a bunch of texts right now uh, so that we understand the importance of this matter. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. This is Yahweh speaking to Joshua as Joshua inherits Moses' mantle. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. I think you heard that, but just to underscore, <laughs> one of the strongest passages in the Bible calling a young man to be not just courageous, but strong and very courageous. There you have it. There's your, we're in tough times. There, there's that call. Joshua is about to try to take back the promised land from one pagan tribe after another. This is not, you know, trying to win your fantasy football league, okay? This is Joshua facing fearsome warriors on all sides. And what does Yahweh say to him? Be strong, very courageous. So definitely we need to call men out of the overflow of this passage. We're not taking the promised land today. We're not in the old covenant era, but this passage still speaks to how disciples are made, I believe. And it tells us strength grounded in God and, and courage is essential to leadership in, 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 in the church and to uh, men, the formation of, of men, young men, Absolutely. These are essential realities. But then what does Yahweh say as well? The one who is called to be strong and very courageous is also called to be the one who is careful to do according to all the law that Moses gave. Don't, that's doubled down on then. Don't turn from it to the right hand or the left. If you don't turn from the law, in other words, if you pay very close attention to revelation, to the word of God in the form Joshua had it in his day, then you will have good success wherever you go. What a wonderful passage this is. If we will hear it afresh, all sides of the Christian church will be profoundly helped and blessed. Those who really do struggle with courage, and there are a lot of people today who struggle with courage, and understandably so. Courage ultimately comes only from God. It's a gift of God. So people who struggle with courage need to hear Joshua 1-7 and other texts and be summoned to find their strength, world-defying, uh, countercultural strength in God. All the strength we need for all the challenges we face is there. It's ours. It's in Christ. It's given us. Okay. But then that's not all. That's not enough just to talk about the need for courage. That's, that's only half the equation. You have to also talk about carefulness. 
literally the term that Wilson said in 2012, and he's repeated that maxim, that formulation over the years, and it got a lot of attention. Uh, you know, the, the careful men will come later. Today, we need the courageous men in desperate times. It got a lot of attention in lockdowns, for example, and you can understand why there as well. But the Bible says that the courageous men have to be careful, and if they are careful, if Joshua and his followers are careful, that's the only way they'll have good success wherever they go. It's to not turn from the law to even a degree, to have a zealous pursuit of God according to the revolution, the revolution, according to the revelation of God. <laughs> the revelation of God is a revolution for us, an ongoing one. That's the only way you're going to have any victory at all, Joshua. That's what Yahweh is saying. You've got to stick very, very, very close to my revelation. And that is not just a word for Joshua. That is a word to every generation of the Christian church. This, this charge is repeated in um, Joshua 22. We read this in Joshua 22.5. Um, this is what Joshua says. Uh, to a number of folks who are of God's people. Only be careful, be very careful, to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. I just repeat myself. I'm not even really having to make a case. Just read the Bible. Reading the Bible destroys the idea that we, we don't need careful men today. We absolutely need careful men today. We need careful men in every generation, but the careful men aren't a different class of men from the courageous men. They're one and the same. The courageous men are the careful men because the courageous men are the men who are shaped by the word of God and the word of God makes you careful, careful to walk in God's ways. Don't conflate that with legalism. Don't conflate that with being uppity. Don't conflate that with being high handed and severe and, and, and very twitchy. Anytime, you know, there's even a hint of, of evil in the world. No, uh, we, we need a kind of robust joy coursing through our veins as Christian men and Christian women alike. But with regard to uh, those, those men of God who need to lead in the home and the church and, and society, society to some degree, those are men who need to have a zealous, dogged pursuit of God's truth so that they are shaped by the word of God in an ongoing way as the spirit works in their heart. All of this is powered by the grace and mercy of God to the glory of God. Those are the men we need. We need courageous men who are careful men. A quick word about Wilson's uh, background formulation. We're in desperate times, he said in July 2012. And I, I have said this before, but you've got to be very careful about what the Christian nationalist crowd, to use that branding, does today. They say we're in really some form of this unprecedented times. We're, we're in the negative world. We're in desperate days. And so we no longer can have men who are careful and men who are thoughtful and men who are gentle and men who are meek and men who are kind. We've got to have gate crashers today. Um, we've got to have soldiers. Um, we've got to have men who arm up and don't apologize and break through walls. And um, there is a ring of truth there. But again, the Bible would rebuke such a vision. And, and that's why I'm covering all of this with regard to the NSA commercial, because the message that rings out from the NSA commercial is the message that has rung out from Moscow for years now. And it is exactly in accordance with what Wilson said in 2012. We are in desperate times. And so we need fearless men. We don't need uh, pious men. We don't need, you know, a piety tradition any longer. We need a gate crashing form of men. Um, we need skull breakers today. And what the Bible would call us to is never to give up courage, but also never to give up carefulness. This is true in many different places. In scripture, I'm going to go rapid fire fashion. First Chronicles 22, 13. I'm just going to read without giving context in what follows. Then you will prosper 
if you are careful to observe the statutes and the rules that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel, be strong and courageous, fear not, do not be dismayed. Once again, what is split apart by Doug Wilson is not split apart in the word of God. It's fused. It's one. You've got to be careful to walk in godliness and you've got to be courageous. It's in the same verse. First Chronicles 22, 13, Ezekiel 20, verse 19. I'm the Lord, your God, walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel 36, 27, the promise of the new covenant that we're in now. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What does the spirit being put within us through saving faith, um, uh, the spirit regenerates us and, and we exercise saving faith, that is. What does the spirit do? The spirit causes us to walk in God's ways and to be careful to obey rules, the Spirit produces carefulness in every believer, boy and girl, man and woman alike, with no exceptions. So if we're, if we're avoiding or, or moving away from carefulness, wow, it might seem like a small thing, but it's not. We're moving away from what the Spirit explicitly is said to bring in the New Covenant era. We're opposing the work of the Spirit. This is serious stuff. Luke 11.35 in the New Testament. Therefore, be careful, Jesus says, lest the light in you be darkness. Luke 12.15, Jesus, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Let a prospering, market-booming institution or series of institutions hear that word afresh. Be on your guard against all covetousness. We all need to hear that challenge, don't we? Especially in the American context, especially when things are going well for our ministry and our works. Guard against covetousness. Guard against profit seeking as your ultimate goal. Acts 20, 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he, Jesus, obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Pay careful attention to yourselves, elders, and to all the flock so that you can care for the church of God, the very body of people obtained by the blood of Jesus through the substitutionary sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross for the church. A careful man can care for the church, but a careless man does not care for the church. That's the formulation that we're given there by extension. So if you have careless uh, men, if you have careless leaders, if you have those who aren't really concerned with holiness, if you have those who aren't, um, you know, fighting against unwholesome speech and unwholesome communication, they're not going to care for people. They may definitely still have a position. They may be very successful in the work they do, but divorce that ongoingly in the future from genuine spiritual care. You may still have an institution. You may train students at the college level to be conservative. You may do that all under the banner of Christianity. You may, in fact, stand for a whole bunch of good things in lots of categories. But if you are not careful, according to the word of God, if you are careless, you are not caring for the rising generation. Uh, you're not leading them faithfully. These are strong words, but I think they're biblical words. Ephesians 5.15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Look carefully how you walk, your tongue, your mind, your desires, your actions, Watch all of it in the power of the spirit, confessing your sin because you're going to see failure on an ongoing basis. So grace has opened up the confession room, so to speak, and it's perpetual. It's not through a priest or something like that. It's ongoing 
to Christ himself. There's no mediator in between you and Christ. You are regularly confessing sin and repenting of it before God because you're watching how you walk. That's what 1 Timothy 4.16 says explicitly. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. As if that's not clear enough, Paul says, persist in this, for by doing so, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. I repeat, if there is anybody at NSA who has an ear to hear what I'm saying from the word of God, not dismissing what I'm saying, understanding I'm trying to speak this in love, not moral superiority, Paul says to persist in this. And if you persist in being watchful over yourself and the teaching and the precious young men and young women entrusted to you, you will save yourself and the hearers. There is much more I could cover, but I'm going to leave that point there. We cannot choose between courage and carefulness. The two are linked all through the Bible. Seventh response to this commercial from NSA. We need to practice submissiveness as Christians. We need to practice submissiveness as Christians. There's a kind of um, cool kid rebellion that seems to be um, hot nowadays in Christian circles. Um, a lot of us <laughs> weren't raised in cool circles as young evangelicals, as those discipled in the church. And um, with lockdown culture and with the left being imperial and trying to shut down Christian activity in all sorts of ways in America and beyond, with neo-Marxists riding toward us, um, opposing the work of the church in all sorts of ways, what has happened, and I talked about this earlier and in the earlier episode, is um, I think for a lot of different uh, reasons, we now think we are our standing posture as Christians is basically kind of a rebel's posture. Now, we're countercultural, Acts 5, 41. We rejoice when we are persecuted for the name of Jesus. We rejoice when that happens. But in general, we've got to resurface Peter's words, for example. Peter was one who understood what it was to have a kind of very bold spirit in the face of evil, in the face of idolatry. And Peter did a version of flicking off the camera when he cut off the ear of the high priest's servant in John 18. Peter took up the sword. Um, Peter fell into the error of thinking that Jesus' work was going to advance through the sword. And that's exactly what Jesus said was not going to happen. Jesus, in fact, had to lay down his life uh, for his kingdom to advance. And Peter himself was going to be called to not take up the sword to advance the Great Commission, but to die. You've got to understand that. And Peter, toward the end of his life, would call the church not to follow him in the error of pugnacious rebellion that he committed in John 18 and other points in his life. Peter called the church in general terms, not always, but in general terms, to be as submissive as possible to governing authorities and constituted uh, authorities in the world. 1 Peter 2.13 be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and Nero is probably on the throne in Peter's time of writing, we need to point out, verse 14, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Here, here verse 15 as well. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil. Talked about that in the previous episode, but living as servants of God. And then verse 17, first Peter two, honor everyone, honor everyone. Who are we doing that in the NSA commercial? Fair question to ask. Love the brotherhood, fear God. And then these shocking words, honor the emperor. What I am not saying here is anything the government says to do, the Christian automatically has to do. 
as the Puritans did in the 17th century, we recently got a great test case for that idea. And many of us came to the conclusion that we, there are in fact mandates from the government we cannot obey. We not only have freedom to not obey, we cannot obey them. We cannot shut down, at least for long, the preaching of the gospel. Um, we must uh, gather the church for worship. Worship is essential. Um, there's not, you know, an off season for worship uh, where you just take off five months of the year, for example, or the government says, you know, there's this serious illness. Maybe it's a real illness, like COVID is a real illness. And, and then the government says, I'm so sorry, you just can't worship Jesus for a long time. So sorry about that. And we say, no, no, we're not doing that. But we need to take real care here because you can fall into the ditch of automatic government accommodation. Yes, many people did. Many people probably will in days ahead as Christians, sadly. But you can fall into the ditch on the other side. And it's a real ditch. And it's one that the scripture speaks against in no uncertain terms because we're supposed to be as submissive to the government as we possibly can can. So I would just, I can't offer a full orbed uh, consideration of all that is happening in Moscow, all that the church there is doing. But I see in this kind of branding and marketing, the selling of a pugnacious, rebellious spirit to the church. And I would offer an, a word of warning. I may be summarily dismissed in offering it. I would say, yes, there's such a thing as being joyfully countercultural, but make sure you don't end up um, thinking you're being that and you're actually disobeying scripture because now you're just a rebel. And you have no countercultural witness. The countercultural witness you're supposed to have fundamentally, by the way, is holiness, according to the word of God, powered by the grace of God. More to say there. Got to say this. Eighth, carefulness as Christians should mark us in all sorts of ways. I've, I've talked about this um, in, in different forms from different verses, but now I need to apply it. And I need to say uh, five, five ways we need to be careful, just very quickly. We need to be exegetically careful. What do I mean? We need to handle the word of God with a jeweler's precision. If diamonds are important in cutting, how much more important is the word of God in preaching? We need young men being trained up to handle the word of God with a jeweler's precision. More than that, the greatest precision there is. We need exegetical carefulness. We need careful men. We must be spiritually careful. We've got to watch our life and doctrine closely. Let's talk about the first part there. We've got to watch our life. It's not that we could drift, brothers and sisters, men and women alike. We all drift. We don't all necessarily drift 10 miles out to sea and make shipwreck of our life and ministry. Praise God. But everybody drifts like a boat in harbor. There's always going to be some drift. It's going to happen, at least in different seasons of our life and ministry. We've got to be honest about that and recognize that we're not the one who keeps ourselves from drifting. We've got to have God working in our heart and life continually. Praise God. That's what the spirit accomplishes in us, helps us see that we're drifting, uses brothers and sisters who offer words that, that open our eyes. Um, the spirit helps us listen, something we all struggle with at different times, but then we, we practice once again, spiritual carefulness. Watch your life closely. Third, we've got to be doctrinally careful. We've got to watch our theology for any sign of slippage. Wilson, Doug Wilson, has gotten in lots of discussions and disagreements over the doctrine of justification. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know exactly where he is on that, where he is with regard to Auburn Avenue theology, um, those kind of matters. I certainly don't have the time and space to get into that now, but I'm going to tell you a life of carefulness manifests in doctrinal carefulness such that those under us in any form, even if it's one person, should know where we are clearly on matters, matters of doctrine. 
Not every doctrine is a first order issue. Let that be said. But we as preachers and teachers of the word of God need to be those who are marked not by sloppiness, not by imprecision, not by lack of clarity. You should know where we are in no uncertain terms because we should be watching our life and doctrine closely. Fifth and finally, we need to be comprehensively careful in everything we do. As men and women of God, we need to be so careful. It's not that we're supposed to live in straitjacket legalism. We're free. For freedom, Christ set us free, Galatians 5.1. But what is a key element of Christian freedom? The freedom to pursue holiness by the power of God. This leads to my ninth and final word on this entire matter. I want to personally challenge Doug Wilson and leaders at New St. Andrews College and anyone in Moscow who cares to hear. I don't mean that everybody is in the same place on this issue. I don't think they are. I would guess they're not. But anyone who who cares enough to listen, thank you for listening to me. I'm nothing. Christ is everything. But as a Christian man, I want to challenge you afresh. Pursue godliness. Christ is is everything, but not in a checking the box way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is on my side. No, the daily pursuit of godliness that not only you have to undertake, we all have to undertake and we all get things wrong. And, and, and some of us are way too soft and way too timid. And we need a serious blood transfusion of courage from Christ. And some of us are, are much too strong. Some are much too weak, some are much too strong. And, and we've got to be um, tamed by the Spirit. And we've got to learn gentleness and learn meekness and learn kindness and so on and so forth. None of us out here is on a high horse. And if we are, we get knocked off it. That is very sure. God loves to knock us off uh, our high horses. And he does so for every believer. We all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. NSA, men I know there and, and respect, training your students to give a middle finger, middle finger excuse me, to idolatry is unsound and ungodly. Please turn away from this. Please confess this sin. Please repent of it before the Lord. I say this as one who must practice confession and repentance every day I live. We cannot train the rising generation of men, but men and women alike, to think that they can be a Christian witness without Christian conduct. There is no such thing. My last word, though, is that, again, this is what the gospel is for. It's not just to get us in the door. It's to bring us back to God when we stray. So I pray, I'm praying for you, and I pray um, as one who has been forgiven much that you will reject this campaign and this form of marketing you will teach your students that this was ungodly and fleshly. And there will be serious course correction at New St. Andrews and in Moscow, because as Christians, we must be courageous and careful alike. And as men, we must be courageous and careful alike. God bless you.